Hi everyone. Well, we've made it. If you can believe it, we are at the end of the semester. Our final discussion is a combination of um, two topics, really. It's chapter 15 and chapter 16 both. Uh, we're going to be discussing urbanization and we're going to be discussing sustainability. So when we started things 15 or so weeks ago, we started with a very generalized discussion of what is environmental science, why environmental science is important, and some of the things that we think about when we're discussing environmental science. So we've been talking through um, a lot of problems, if you think of it that way, that our Earth is facing. So between um, overpopulation and climate change, water pollution, air pollution, um, threats to biodiversity, and all the other myriad of topics we've discussed, it sort of leaves us here at the end with this now what? Now that we understand all of these challenges, what are some practical things that we can actually do to make things better? And you'll note that the end of every chapter that we've discussed so far always had suggestions, right? So individual things that, that we could do. So recycle and reduce our waste and conserve water and eat local foods and all of the sort of the little things. If you pull all of those little things together, what you're really talking about is you're talking about this topic of what we call sustainability or this idea of sustainability. So our goal here then is to think about actions we can take now that make sure that we protect and preserve what we have for the future. So this chapter has um, probably one of my favorite sayings, and this is probably a, a saying that you've heard hopefully many times yourself, uh, and it comes from Margaret Mead, and um, it's kind of a good reminder right now because sometimes it can feel like challenges are overwhelming or they're insurmountable and, and how can we possibly tackle all of these things. But it's important to remember that a small, highly committed group of individuals can change the world and, and really those are the people who have really been a change for good um, for as, as long as we have written history, essentially. You have these, these concrete ideas that start with a small group and they spread larger and larger and larger, uh, and they really are for, for the better of everyone. And that's the truth about environmental policies, environmental protection as well. Uh, even though it can seem like sometimes these somewhat insurmountable challenges that we are facing please note that these are things that are always possible um, and these are things that we can tackle as we move through the future as long as we have a good solid game plan. So with this particular chapter I'm actually going to pass over uh, a little bit of urbanization. The reason that I'm doing that is because this week's assignment you're going to watch a TED Ed video and it's going to sort of give you the history of cities. Uh, it's going to talk about why cities grew um, historically, how they were developed, why they continue to attract people, and how we expect them to grow in the future. So a lot of it is the same thing that is in uh, these lecture notes. So uh, again, I'm, I'm not really going to talk too much about this concept of urbanization, but the idea here is that urban areas are going to continue to grow um, faster than rural areas. So you will note that rural areas are are sort of flat or declining in population, whereas um, urban areas, both in more developed countries and in less developed countries, are continuing to develop. And again, the idea here is this is where more opportunities uh, can be found, especially when it comes to job prospects. So again, lots of big cities. This is how we expect them to grow in the future. Uh, lots of people are moving to big cities because, again, there's opportunities there, uh, more economic opportunities in a urban area than there are in rural areas. However, cities don't have, um, cities aren't without their own problems, right? So the more people you have, the more pollution you create, the more waste you create, the more resources you need to keep the cities going. So cities are not the end-all be-all as, as far as environmental solutions go. Um, in one way, they, they condense human populations, which can be a good thing because it, it leaves more land for other living things, but it also means that you have a, a condensed area of, again, a lot of pollution, waste, and resources that you need to utilize. So um, these are some problems with cities, lacking housing. So how do we get around that? We use this concept of urban planning. Um, urban planning is 
another word or something you've probably maybe particularly heard is this concept of, of a new urban planning called smart growth. So when we're thinking about how we grow our urban areas, let's do so uh, responsibly and do it in a smart way. Let's connect it to current lines of transportation. Uh, let's make things walkable as possible. People like to be able to walk places and not have to rely on transportation. Um, previously, city developments would sprawl out rather than be concentration, concentrated. It's the concept behind urban sprawl, which is a really big thing here in the city of Chicago. We've been seeing sprawl for decades, essentially, um, as suburbs grow further and further away from the city. That's, that's what sprawl is. So it becomes transportation dependent. Uh, you can't really get around too many suburbs these days without a car. If you need to get to the grocery store, if you need to get to your school, if you need to get to wherever you're going, you're more likely than in your car than not. Um, whereas when you think of smart planning um, and sort of putting transportation uh, into sort of a more regional aspect where people can get on a bus or a train um, or uh, some type of commuter rail and get to where they need to go. So making, again, our cities more livable, that's the concept of smart growth. So also we can also call it new urbanism. There's lots of different names for it. And again, yes, I'm going through these principles very quickly, but there's a video that kind of covers this in more detail. So have smaller cities, make them really walkable, build green spaces around them so that people can enjoy. That's kind of the idea. Um, the other thing, so again, I'm, again, I'm passing these pretty pictures, but there's other concepts to new urbanisms like green roofs, for example, which Chicago is really good at, by the way. Um, all of that is leading into the second part of this discussion, which is sustainability. And the idea here, once again, is to be sustainable means to be able to provide for the needs of humans right now, but also make sure that we can provide for the needs of humans in the future. So not using too many resources, uh, and then there's no more resources to use in the future, right? So we kind of talked about our basic needs very, very early on. We said all living things need food, water, shelter, and space. The concept behind sustainability is to be able to acquire those things that we need and yet not take more than is necessary to make sure that we are providing for future generations so that they too will have access to the things that we have access to now. If you combine that with development, um, what it means is that once again, you are developing urban areas, you're developing places for people to live, work, recreate, whatever it happens to be that is not overly destructive, that we're just using those resources that we require, but we're preserving, protecting plenty, plenty of resources for the future as well. I am not at all discussing economics. <laughs> um, ecological economics is its own other whole chapter, essentially, um, that if we were environmental scientists and I were training you to be environmental scientists, I would essentially put a lot of emphasis on this particular topic because it would be important for you to understand the difference between sort of classic economics and what we're calling ecological economics. And it has a lot to do with, you know, um, gross domestic products and it has to do with um, uh, supply and demand and so on and so forth. Uh, if you've ever taken an e economics course, some of this will probably ring true to you. Ecological economics is slightly different in the sense that we are looking more at um, systems uh, and we're also looking at the value of uh, ecological services. So um, in that key concepts from chapter five, we kind of touched on a little of those key services that the um, the environment provides for us, white, right? We talked about um, flood protection in wetlands, for example. Um, we also talked about how um, uh, coastal areas, coral reefs and things are uh, places where you have a lot of uh, fisheries and, and a lot of um, biodiversity in the ocean. So those, again, are services that the earth is providing to us for free. In ecological economics, we incorporate that into our picture of an economy. So you wouldn't destroy that wetland, for example, because it's a prime piece of real estate where you could build an office building. Instead, you would value that real estate because it's providing a natural water holding service. So when you get a lot of rain, you don't see flooding. 
because that wetland is holding that water. So it's a, it's a service that the ecosystem is providing for free. So in any case, having gone past all that, um, this is probably something that I think we hit on like in the very beginning of the semester, but I, I don't know that we ever gave an actual sort of distinct definition. So we've been talking about sustainability and this concept of resources and using resources wisely. Just as a note, there's two types of resources. We have non-renewable resources and renewable resources. And we, we kind of talked about this when we were discussing energy, if you remember, right? So non-renewable sources of energy were those fossil fuels, for example, the, the coal, the oil, the gas, those types of things. And then we also talked about renewable uh, energy sources, so wind and solar and hydroelectric. Similarly, when you talk about just resources in general, Anything that's non-renewable is something that is finite and we're going to run out of it someday. So in addition to fuels, we could also add minerals to this list. Um, renewable resources are things that should be around in an infinite supply as long as they're managed properly. So we say water, fresh water, right? Again, assuming that we are using it responsibly and not wasting it, that's a renewable resource because we continue to have the water cycle moving that water around the atmosphere. Um, other things such as um, timber, for example, wood and trees. As long as we don't tear the forests down too quickly and we replant those and regrow those, we should continue to have a supply of wood and timber uh, for our building purposes. So to manage these things is part of this idea of being sustainable, not using more than we should. So trying to find ways to reduce our need for non-renewable resources and trying to shift over into a model where we're relying more on a steady supply of renewable resources, things that we know will continue to be available in the future. Um, I'm not going to talk about tragedy of the commons. I'm not going to talk about natural resource accounting. That's a lot of information you don't need. Um, I'm not even going to talk about green business and green design. Importance. Don't get me wrong. Green business and green design are important. Um, if you're interested, um, I would certainly take a look and uh, just do sort of a, a quick search, internet search for uh, green businesses. And you'll get a, a whole uh, host of information and websites that sort of point you into directions of companies that really truly are trying to be what we call um, another word to say sustainable is green. That's a, a, a kind of a common catch-all phrase that we use to describe something that's environmentally friendly. We say it's green. So a green cleaning product or a company that is um, a, a green company. They are uh, using few resources and they are doing their best to reduce the amount of waste they create. So in any case, there's a whole host of different categories when it comes to these sort of green businesses and, uh, and green services and industries. And it's if it's something you're interested, I, I definitely encourage you to, like I said, just do a quick internet search and you can really learn a lot about um, different companies who really trying are really trying hard to make sure that their companies are having a, a minimal impact on the environment, or at least as much as they can. So going back to this concept of sustainability and sustainable development, we know the population is going to continue to grow. We know that the global population seven and a half billion people now what does the future hold we talked about a few different models right we said uh maybe 10 billion that's kind of a, a common number that everybody's settling on right now it could be as many as 12 maybe we'll top out as few as nine potentially somewhere in between the idea is is we're still going to need to be able to provide for those two three four billion people that we still have uh, in the future in order to do that, we need a model. And that model, again, is this concept of sustainable development. And sort of we have these intersecting circles that recommend, or excuse me, that explain how we're going to do all of this. So we have to meet basic human needs, right? Food, water, shelter, and space. So that's sort of this circle here. We want to maintain the health of our ecosystems. We want to make sure that we are protecting the environment as well. But we also want to be able to have economic growth, right? Economic growth is especially important for those developing countries, those ones that are just getting started and they're just at the point where they're 
raising the standard of living for their people. And in order to keep doing that, they need to have this economic growth. So where all of these things intersect, ideally, would be um, sustainably. And if we do that, we can meet our basic human needs by using technology, using things like the Green Revolution. We can protect people and the environment, making sure that people have access to clean water and to clean air. Uh, and if people have access to clean air and clean water, so do living things. But then also making sure that we are protecting our amenities. It's not right to think that we're just going to, to give everything up about our lifestyles uh, and completely adopt sort of a, a new salt of the earth, live off what you can grow sort of mentality when that's, that's really not part of who we are or part of our culture. However, we can make changes, right? We can live maybe in smaller, more efficient homes. We can walk more places and drive less. So there's definitely choices we can make. So here we have a whole list of the goals of sustainable development. You can kind of read all of these. I particularly like this nice infographic. So this was the um, this was an infographic that was put together as part of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And essentially, this was what we would like to see. And again, now it's 10 years from now, but when it was put together, it was it was longer. Um, but this is what we would like to see by the year 2030 when it comes to sustainable development. Again, making sure we have what we now to meet our needs, but also making sure that in the future, that we also have things to meet the needs of future generations. So um, again, especially tackling things like poverty and, poverty and hunger and health, education, gender equality, so these are things that, again, are sort of um, uh, very much people-centric ideas. Um, other things that we need, we need clean, affordable energy, economic growth, infrastructure, smart infrastructure, sustainable cities and communities. And then also looking at, once again, sort of these individual choices and, and corporate choices also that we're going to start to need to make in the future. So looking at reducing consumption tackling climate change, making sure we protect our oceans, making sure we protect our forests and our uh, other really biodiverse rich ecosystems. Uh, and again, working together on all of this. So this course can be bleak sometimes, I won't lie. Sometimes as you go through the chapters and you see all of the problems that we're facing and all of the things that it feels like are impossible to do. It's nice to end on this note because it is possible. All of these things are possible. It's going to take effort. It's going to take some time and it's going to take personal action. Um, we have to want these changes to see these changes. And we also have to advocate for these changes, right? We have to tell people who are in charge, that this is a, something that's important to us, that, that we want these things for ourselves and for future generations. And it's not just okay to just go with the status quo, that we want to see these changes. And so how do you do that? Two ways. You do it with your dollars and you do it with your vote. So those really two are the, the two biggest ways that, that you can change things right now is making sure that those people who have values that you value are representing you and also making sure you're spending your money on those companies um, or spending your money supporting those companies who really are looking at the future of the planet in general and not just their bottom line. I know it's not always easy to do, but it's something that is a worthwhile effort. So that finishes things off. That's all the lecture content we have uh, for the entire book. So um, please make sure, again, that you look at that TED-Ed lecture that goes through urbanization because it's got good information about uh, those development of cities.